The Bible said to everything there is a season at a time. Is it your time to establish your positive momentum? Is it your time to be everything that God has called and created you to be? Is it your time to take your business, your ministry, your concept, your ideas, your visions to a new level and a new dimension? Well then, I have written a book just for you. It is entitled Intentional Momentum. Once you establish your positive momentum, you will become unstoppable in achieving your dreams and your visions. This book will show you how. In it, you will find the strategy, the methodology that God has ordained for you to achieve success in every area of your life. Are you a momentum maker? My answer is yes, you are. Be blessed and stay supernatural. Good evening and praise the Lord to everyone. Welcome to this Tuesday evening Midweek Manor Bible Study. Originating from Calvary Ministries International here in the city of God in Youngstown, Ohio. Well, saints, I'm so grateful that God has allowed us this time to be together once again. And to those of you that have joined us from wherever you are. We have a greeting both in Calvary and Christ Church that we want to welcome you into this Bible study on tonight. I think you know what it is, saints. I need everyone everywhere to help me welcome everyone to this evening Bible study with these words in the comment section you belong here. I need everyone to type that in the comment section tonight. You belong here. There's no doubt about it. God has ordered your steps to this Bible study this evening and we are glad you're here because you do belong here at Calvary. Well, tonight, before we get into the word of the Lord, we are sending our prayers, our love, and the comfort of God to the family of Sister Lois Powell. We are praying for Sister Powell and for her family. Sister Powell's homegoing celebration will be tomorrow at Mount Calvary. The calling hours are from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., and the homegoing celebration begins at 11 a.m. on tomorrow, Wednesday, May the 12th, at Mount Calvary. And our prayers are with all of her family, friends, and loved ones. Many of you have heard of the homegoing or beloved saint of God, Sister Jeanette Wilson, has gone home to be with the Lord. She's now absent from the body and present with the Lord, asking your prayers for her family, that God will strengthen and comfort them, and more information regarding her homegoing celebration will be forthcoming. To all of our friends and viewers in the Warren, Ohio area, we are coming to warn the Calvary family, the praise team, the musicians, the intercessors, the deacons, the mothers, and the saints of Calvary. We'll be celebrating next Wednesday night, May 19th, with our sister church and my brother and my pastor, the Honorable Bishop James Laverne Tyson, Calvary will be going over to Warren, Ohio on next Wednesday night, May 19th, in a pandemic praise fellowship service. Well, this will be our first time to worship with the Greater Apostolic Faith family in Warren since my brother and sister have returned to the area 
as the pastors of that great church. And I would like to implore and invite all of the Calvary family, those of you that are moving out now and moving around, those of you that feel safe in coming into a worship environment, and I'm sure you'll be safe there at Greater Apostolic Faith. Beautiful, spacious, large, well-ventilated sanctuary with social distancing, taking of temperatures and the wearing of masks. We'll be there next Wednesday night in a great fellowship between Calvary and Greater Apostolic. Next Wednesday night, May 19th, in Warren, Ohio, 3571 Todd Avenue, Northwest, in the beautiful city of Warren. And I want to see all of my friends in that Warren area in that great service. Now this evening, we're going to prepare to go to the word of the Lord. And before we read the scripture, I want you to just join me in a moment of prayer and then we'll move right into our Bible study for this evening. Shall we lift our hands before the Lord wherever you are? Father, we thank you for the kindness of God that has been demonstrated unto us all throughout this day. Now as we prepare to reach its conclusion, we ask that you would give us another word from the Lord, spiritual direction, revelation, insight and understanding concerning the mind and the will of God for your people in this season and in this time. Now anoint us afresh and cause us to take this word and put it into practical application in Jesus' name, praise God, amen. Well, if you haven't done so yet, I'm going to ask everyone to take just a moment and hit those share buttons. If I could get everyone to push that share button, we can get this word into as many ears and hearts as we possibly can tonight for a very informative and powerful, timely word that the Lord has placed in my spirit for us on this evening. And you will find me in the word of the Lord in the book of John. John chapter one and verse 23. Make sure you hit those share buttons, everyone. And then meet me in John chapter 1 and verse 23. Saints, I want to thank you for your continued support of the house of God with your tithes and with your offering. And as soon as we leave the air tonight, when we go off, make sure that you worship the Lord with your midweek offering and we are endeavoring give, to give the Lord $20 offering during the midweek service. So I'm going to ask you to do that tonight if you are able or as close to it as you can. And if you were unable to tithe on Sunday, be mindful tonight of the Lord's tithe and the blessing of the Lord be upon you all. We're in John 1 and 23. I think I should say that you don't have to be a member of Calvary to give into this ministry. You don't have to be a member of Christ Church to share with that great ministry. If you want to be a participant in kingdom building, and some of you watch us every week, won't you consider sharing a seed offering with this great ministry, it will help us to continue to expand this ministry to the world, literally. It will be a blessing to us and it will be a blessing to you. 
and I thank you in advance. John 1 and 23. We're reading together aloud, please. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. I want to use for a subject for this evening's study, don't lose your voice. Don't lose your voice. Today, the emphasis of the Holy Spirit, both in the Noonday Bible study and on this evening, has been upon the imperative necessity for the voice, the witness of the people of God to be intentionally infused into the general culture at a time where men, women, boys, and girls are searching for answers that can only be found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I like to stay close to the young people. Number one, because I am youthful and dynamic. Watch it now, watch it, watch it, be careful what you put in that comment section. Number one, because I am youthful and dynamic. And secondly, because I just have a heart for young people. And being with them, being around them helps keep me young and it helps keep me informed and keep me relevant. There is somewhat of a feeling, a concept that is circulating throughout the body of Christ that young people are not as interested in church as the generations that preceded them. I don't believe that. I don't believe that to be true at all. Now, it may be true that they're not interested in church the way it was 40, 50, 60 years ago. But I don't interpret that to mean that young people are not interested in the church and that they're not interested in ministry or not interested in advancing the kingdom of God. Deacon Matthew and I were in Gallatin, Tennessee on Saturday night. A group of young people praising God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. It re-energized me. Been the first time in a while where I'd seen a group of strictly millennials and Generation Z. That group was 95 comprised of young people in that age range. And they were going forth in a great worship and a great praise. And it just, it inspired me. We have great young people in our church whom God is positioning to do great things for the kingdom of God and for the church in this season. You have heard me say, and it is indisputable, that a church without young people is a church without a future. And tonight I want to talk to our young people and I wanna to talk to our parents and our grandparents. It's going to take understanding communication, collaboration between all generations for us to reach the culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ in this season. 
It's going to literally take sons and daughters, dreams and visions, the mature and the young, working together as one unit to help save an untoward generation. Long before the term influencer was coined, young people played that role in our society, creating and interpreting trends. Now we have a new generation of influencers that have come on the scene. Uh, they are referred to as Generation Z, Gen Z. This is loosely young people that were born between 1995 and 2010 in that range. These young people are true digital natives. They don't know a world without computers. They don't know a world without uh, iPhones and iPads and laptops and, and apps and so forth and so on. From the cradle, they have been exposed to the internet, to social networks, and to mobile systems. This context in which they were born has produced a very hypercognitive generation. They're very comfortable with collecting and cross-referencing many sources of information, of integrating virtual and offline experiences. One study reveals that four core Gen X behaviors are all anchored in one element, their search for truth. I want to dispel this notion that seems to be circulating among some older Christians Oh, these young folk, they, 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 they don't want to be saved. They don't want to live right. They don't want to, no, 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 no. That's not true. What is true is that they do not want a false presentation of a religious experience that cannot be backed up with relational truth. Now that's true. This particular generation is in search of truth. Look at these four core behaviors shared among Gen Zers. Number one, they value individual expression and avoid labels. Number two, they have the ability to mobilize themselves for a variety of causes. We've seen this in the, more, in the more recent civil right activities, in the protests, and how tens and thousands of young people have been able to come together quickly in cities around the world in a matter of minutes. Number three, they believe deeply in the efficacy of dialogue to solve conflicts and to improve the world. And number four, they make decisions and relate to institutions and organizations in a highly analytical and pragmatic way. There has to be a reason for it, for them to be involved with it. In contrast, the previous generation, the millennials, sometimes called the me generation, the millennials got their start in a, in a time of economic prosperity, which lends them to have more of a focus on self-preservation. Of course, these are general characteristics. Millennials are thought to be more idealistic, definitely more confrontational 
and sometimes less willing to take things at face value. Now, one of the great challenges that all Christians, regardless of age, one of the great challenges that we are having now is finding our voice in the culture. Tonight, more specifically speaking to our Gen Z, Gen Zers, as they call them, and millennials. I think that parents and grandparents have to have ongoing conversations and dialogue with our young people to understand the way they think and where they're coming from. It's been my experience in my conversations with my son and my daughter and my sons and daughters in the ministry as a generation. From my perspective, they hold few things more dearly than acceptance and inclusivity. That seems to be very important. And there seems to be uh, a feeling among them that acceptance means affirmation. So if you don't affirm, it means that you don't accept. This unfortunately permeates all of the culture, not just Generation Z, not just the millennials, where to be welcoming, welcoming is code for condoning all lifestyle choices. I want you to stay with me. So then the question is, what kind of voice should believers be using in the culture that gives a proper representation of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, and its distinction from the world and the things of the world. Well, biblically speaking, there are three primary voices that speak into the culture. They are number one, the prophetic voice. We'll use Jeremiah as an example. Jeremiah was the prophetic voice, clear in his denunciations and clear in his warnings. The prophetic voice is a voice of admonishment. The prophetic voice is a voice of correction, which is something that is greatly resisted in our time. The prophetic voice is one of direction. It is a clarion call from the spirit of God through the prophet to turn from one's wicked ways and turn to God. We have a very unbalanced representation of the prophetic voice in this season because most prophecy that we hear online, on the internet, on television, is about the next car, the next job, how much money you're going to get in seven days. Your husband, your knight in shining armor is going to knock on the door in seven days. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I believe that the blessings of God can be declared through a word of prophecy. No doubt about that. But there has to be a balance to the prophetic voice. There is a major component that is missing in the prophetic declaration that must come to the forefront in this hour, and that is turn from your wicked ways. 
this aspect of the prophetic voice is not a popular voice for the culture to hear. And the scripture said it would be that way. For the time shall come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. So in many cases, if you are speaking authentic biblical truth, people will tune you out. And that's why it's not a popular voice for Christians to use. But as I was teaching in Noonday Bible study, no matter what people decide they want to hear, not hear, listen to, or not listen to, right is still right, wrong is still wrong, hell is still smoking, and God show sure ain't joking. Amen. The second voice that speaks to the culture is the evangelistic voice. This is tremendously illustrated in Acts chapter 17 with the Apostle Paul preaching at Mars Hill. Notice Acts chapter 17 and verse 22, the evangelistic voice. Acts chapter 17, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceived that in all things ye are too superstitious. Verse 23, for as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, the true and the living God, declare I unto you. The evangelistic voice is the one attempting to build bridges across cultural divides to explain things, to make apologetic cases. Do you notice the wisdom of Paul's approach to his presentation of his message? He didn't talk down to them. Notice the language he used. He respected their religious orthodoxy. He said, I beheld your devotions. The evangelistic voice is focused on calling people from a religious, ritualistic experiment to a spiritual and relational personal experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the evangelistic voice. And I want those of you that didn't see Noonday Bible study, I definitely want you in your time, spare time to make sure you go back and watch Noonday Bible study because in midday Bible study, I talked extensively about the wisdom of the evangelistic voice. The third voice that speaks into the culture is one we never want to be guilty of, the heretical voice, the heretical voice. Heretical voices in the scripture are never celebrated, but they are noted. The false prophets of both the Old Testament and the New Testament are frequently detailed. Look over in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 1 with me. Friend, you must be extremely selective about who you lend your ear to in this season that claim to be speaking for God. Second Peter chapter two and verse number one. You must, friend, student, saint, you must study to show yourself approved. You must spend time in the scriptures, reading the scriptures, memorizing the scriptures, outside of these Bible studies where we are teaching 
so that when a heretical voice begins to speak something that is in that is contradictory to the word of God, you will be able to hear the spiritual distortion in that voice. Second Peter chapter two and verse number one. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. These are prophecies of private interpretation. Even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Let's look at a definition of that word heresies. Heresies, number one, of taking, capture, storming a city. Number two, heresies, choosing or choice. Number three, heresies is defined as that which is chosen. Number four, heresies, a body of men following their own tenets. Other names by which they are known as a sect, a party, more modern terminology would be a cult. Number five, heresies are defined as dissensions arising from diversity of opinions and aims. May I say something to us tonight? When God has given his judgment, on a particular matter, man's opinion doesn't matter. I have never in my life seen a time where people are so comfortable challenging the word of God be careful with that. I'm always careful when someone shows me from the scripture, thus saith the Lord. I'm, I, I, I'm pretty sure I don't let these words come out of my mouth, but I think. And there's a lot of but I think going on right now as it pertains to what God has clearly outlined in the scripture as his standard and his way and his will. When God has spoken, man's opinion doesn't matter. And because we debate everything else and because we want to have a town hall meeting about everything else, we think we're going to have a town hall meeting on God. Not so. Not so. The kingdom of God is a theocratic kingdom. It's not democratic. You don't vote on the will of God. So then, this heretical voice is a voice that not, not only speaks against the gospel, but what makes it especially dangerous is that it tries to mix truth with error. What makes the heretical voice especially dangerous is that it attempts to distort the gospel's presentation to fit cultural acceptance. Very dangerous. Because my ear is trained because of my musical background, to hear the smallest variation in tones and in notes. If there is distortion in a microphone, 
me and Minister John and Mr. Wagner may be the only people in the church that hear it. And Elder Gilchrist, probably Brother Cliff, because of the way our ear is trained. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said. You have to be able to hear someone speak, preach, teach, prophesy, and they perhaps they bring forth 10 principles, but they slip in one that has distortion to it. And in the context of the way they interpreted the word and wrongly divided it, you have to throw out the entire message. And now there is a lot of underlying distortion in much of the prophetic utterances that are being declared because many people are now trying to present a gospel that has cultural acceptance. The key in attempting to speak into the culture with relevance but not compromise, relevance but not compromise. Let's put that in the comment section. Relevance but not compromise. We want to speak into the culture. Don't lose your voice. We want to speak into the culture with relevance, but not compromise. I need to see that come up on that screen a hundred times. Relevance, but not compromise. This is found in the dynamic between translation and transformation. Now I'm gonna be using the word transformation in this context differently than we normally use it when we're teaching from scripture. Stay with me. Every generation must translate the gospel into its unique cultural context. Absolutely no problem with that. Another way of saying that is we must tailor the method to be relevant to our generation without compromising the message. We're talking about translation as method. We're talking about transformation as method. Every generation must translate the gospel into its unique cultural context. I agree with that. But this is very different then transforming the message of the gospel into something that was never intended by God or the biblical witness. Transformation and tampering with the word of God must be avoided at all costs. Translation, however, is essential as Paul shows us in Acts 17, for a relevant and compelling presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As you can see, the Spirit is very interested in God using us to help people get saved this summer. It is this interplay between translation and transformation that has to be navigated by every Christian, by every young person in particular, in regard to the culture. If transformation or compromise of the word takes place, if we abandon scriptural orthodoxy for the purpose of filling up empty seats 
and tickling itching ears. If translation takes place and we intentionally build bridges of cultural understanding but retain our prophetic integrity in the marketplace, that's how individuals will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I know it's kind of difficult to see that word transformation in a different light, but I'm using it in a different way in, in context of this lesson. We do not want to transform the word into something else. We want the word to transform us into someone else. I, I'm appalled by what I'm hearing in many cases. People trying to change the word to fit and to accommodate their sin. The devil is a liar. Transformation of the word in that manner is heresy. It is translation of the word of God through the spirit of revelation that will bring about relevancy to the culture. Almost finished for tonight. Galatians chapter one and verse number eight. Those three voices, the prophetic voice, the evangelistic voice, and the third, we don't want anything to do with, the heretical voice. Galatians chapter one, verses eight through 12. Galatians 1, verses 8 through 12. Let's read, family. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. I'm preaching the same gospel that Bishop Raymond Robinson preached. The same gospel that Bishop James E. Tyson preached. The same gospel that Bishop Norman L. Wagner preached. Verse number nine, I can't change it. I don't have the right to change it, no matter what's going on in the culture. And as we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be a curse. Verse 10, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Come on, saints, verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, verse 12. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Knowing the difference between transformation and translation, knowing the difference is the crucible of maintaining the integrity of our Christian witness and the difference between being in the world and of the world. Young people, saints, Parents, grandparents, we are to be the voice that cries in the wilderness saying, make ready for the king of glory who is soon to come. Don't lose your voice and do not allow your voice to become distorted with a message, with a witness, with a life, with a lifestyle that compromises the pure integrity of the word of God. Let us be mindful. We are not here to change God's word. We are here to allow God's word 
to change us. Don't lose your voice. The Lord bless you tonight. Heaven smile upon you. The grace of God be with you. Let us honor the Lord in our tithes and our offering tonight. When we go off the air, everyone go to that giving platform for the church. Give along electronically via PayPal or Cash App. $20 tonight in the midweek offering. Be mindful of the Lord's tithe. Don't lose your voice. Walk in to, walk in the integrity of God's word. God bless you tonight, saints. Have a peaceful evening. Remember the families of those who have lost loved ones in your prayers tonight. Stay safe, stay saved, and stay supernatural. Have a blessed evening in Jesus' name.